Well, I'm happy to join you here today in my third week as NASA Administrator to talk about the agency's vision for Mars. I also want to take a, take a moment to thank all of those folks that are watching online. I've heard it's thousands, and it's, uh, it's great that there is so much interest in this effort of this nation and the world to get to Mars. On May 4th, 1801, Thomas Jefferson delivered his first inaugural address. He discussed, quote, a rising nation spread over a wide and fruitful land, traversing all the seas with the rich productions of their industry, engaged in commerce with the nations, advancing rapidly to destinations beyond the reach of mortal eye. Less than two years later, President Jefferson sent a confidential request to Congress asking for $2,500 to explore the West. When approved, he gave instructions to Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. It was clear that his interest was science and discovery. He requested descriptions of animals and vegetables and minerals and, quote, other curious things. For the next 66 years, our mobility was largely unchanged, our mobility west. Many ideas and concepts were developed and many plans were made, but the government simply could not do it alone, so nothing materialized. In 1860 and in 1861, the U.S. House passed bills to build a railroad west. The Senate refused. In 1862, Congress finally passed the Pacific Railroad Act, enabling public funds to support private equity and private bonds to finally build the railroads west and deliver more commerce, more settlement, more economic growth, and a stronger, more prosperous America, which eventually led to a freer and a safer world. On September 12, 1962, John F. Kennedy delivered his own science and discovery challenge for America at Rice University, my alma mater. And on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the lunar surface. We in this room know that this was just the beginning. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And I know Buzz Aldrin is here. He would tell you that Buzz Aldrin is Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> after 66 years, uh, 66 years after the Lewis and Clark expedition, we built the railroad. It took 66 years. 49 years after Apollo 11, it's time to build our own railroad. Like then, we need to enable public funds to support private equity and private bonds to deliver more commerce, more economic growth, and solidify American leadership in space, science, and discovery. I am fortunate that my time as NASA Administrator comes on the heels of Michael Griffin, Charlie Bolden, and Robert Lightfoot, who envisioned and advanced commercialization of low Earth orbit significantly lowering the costs and increasing the access to space. Their model can be extended to and around the moon and deeper into space, including Mars. Moving into the present, on Saturday, we launched InSight to Mars. This was a government lander built by American industry with international partners launched on a commercially procured ULA rocket from an Air Force base. This is, in fact, this is, in fact, evidence that we are building the railroad, tie by tie, stake by stake. Insight will help us understand the history of Mars so that we can better understand our own planet. Some people online might not be aware. There are probably young folks listening today. Mars used to have a vast ocean. Over two-thirds of Mars used to have an ocean. It used to have a, a magnetosphere that would protect it, and it had a, a thick atmosphere. And at some point in the past, Mars changed. We need to understand what caused that, what is the history, so that we can better understand our own planet. Since this is the Human to Mars Summit, InSight will also help us understand risks to human beings. Mars, of close, is closer to the asteroid belt. It has its own meteor showers. And of course, a, a less thick atmosphere means that there's more danger should humans, when humans, get to Mars. 
Mars, of course, has Mars quakes, and Mars has volcanoes. Insight is going to help us better understand the risks to humans so that when we go, we'll be better informed and better prepared. As many of you know, a few days ago, we released a draft RFP encouraging the US commercial space industry to help us deliver payloads to the moon. Some of you are concerned, if I should say, if some of you are concerned that our focus in the coming years is the moon, don't be. The president's vision has emphasized that our exploration campaign will establish American leadership in the human exploration of Mars. We are doing both the moon and Mars in tandem, and the missions are supportive of each other. In fact, our return to the surface of the moon will allow us to prove and advance technologies that will feed forward to Mars, precision landing systems, methane engines, orbital habitation, surface habitation, surface mobility, long duration life support operations, and much more that will enable us to land the first Americans on the Red Planet. While these lunar efforts are underway, we're preparing for Mars 2020, which will be the most advanced rover ever launched to Mars, and which includes a critical human mission precursor payload, MOXIE. MOXIE will demonstrate for the first time our ability to process oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the, Mar in the Martian atmosphere. Mars 2020 will also include hardware to prepare for an eventual Mars sample return mission. Mars sample return and its capabilities will also enable and inform future human exploration missions. NASA is working to build a sustainable, enduring capability that will support a steady cadence of missions to deep space. This is why we need a thriving LEO economy which can expand deeper into space, and we need a government backbone to explore where an economy doesn't yet exist. We need the Space Launch System and we need the Orion Crew Vehicle. We need a thriving industrial base and a worldwide coalition focused on this goal and sustaining it by inspiring the next generation. The Humans to Mars Summit serves as part of this inspiration. I used to be the executive director of the Tulsa Air and Space Museum. In that capacity, I saw the massive impact that the work of the space community has on inspiring children and changing lives. Every person here has a life experience that got them interested in science discovery and exploration. This summit is critical because we not only need all of you in this room who are already sold on exploration or the aerospace groups whose livelihoods and passions are intricately tied to it, we also need the next generation. Thomas Jefferson's desire to explore preceded his inaugural in 1801. He was inspired by the stories of Captain James Cook, a British sailor and explorer who led expeditions to map the unknown world, discover new places, and make scientific discoveries. This inspiration motivated Th Thomas Jefferson to lead America toward science, discovery, and exploration, resulting in more commerce, more settlement, more economic growth, and a stronger, more prosperous America, which eventually led to a freer and safer world. You in this room are doing no less, and I and the NASA family are exceptionally grateful. Thank you so much.